magic words. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, everyone. My name is Laura Dugan, and I'm a litigator at Blake Castles and Graydon LLP here in Toronto, also known as Blake's. And it is my pleasure to be here with you this morning to chair this panel on Peter in court, remembering and celebrating Peter's career as a lawyer and advocate. First, I'd like to take a minute to introduce you to our esteemed panelists. They are all incredibly accomplished advocates, one now turned judge, and it would probably take up half the time of this panel for me to list all of their accolades and accomplishments. So we've agreed in the interest of time to dispense with the formal recitation of their biographies this morning, so, and I will be very brief. The Honorable Justice Paul Shabis was appointed to the Ontario Superior Court of Justice in 2019. Prior to his appointment, Justice Shabis was a senior litigation partner at Blake's in Toronto and a former treasurer of the Law Society of Ontario. An accomplished trial and appellate lawyer, he handled a wide range of cases from complex commercial cases, including tax and class action matters to constitutional and administrative law. Gail Sinclair, to my left is general counsel at the Department of Justice. She has been with the Department of Justice for over 30 years, representing the Attorney General of Canada in many seminal cases, such as Halpern and the 2004 same-sex marriage reference, which we will hear more about this morning, as well as many others. To her left, Michael Morris is a senior general counsel with the Department of Justice Ontario Regional Office. He litigates public law cases on behalf of the federal crown at every court level. And as we will hear more about this morning, Michael was co-counsel for Canada together with Peter Hogg in the same-sex marriage reference at the Supreme Court. At the end of the, the table, <coughs> Kathy Began Flood is the co-practice group leader of the Toronto Litigation Group and National Cybersecurity Working Group at Blake's. Kathy was a former research assistant to Professor Peter Hogg when she was a student at Osgoode and worked frequently with Peter throughout his advocacy career at Blake's, including working with him on more than a dozen constitutional law opinions and appearing with him at the Supreme Court of Canada. I would encourage you to visit the speaker section of the conference website for further information on their very impressive accomplishments. As for me, I was very fortunate to know and work with Peter at Blake's. In my first years of practice, Peter was always kind and generous with his time, despite his rock star like reputation to a then new lawyer like myself, having just taken constitutional law at Osgoode. I will never forget the time that he walked into my office and asked me, a then third year associate, to write a paper with him for an upcoming Aboriginal law conference. I was excited and completely terrified. But Peter had a way of putting people at ease. <coughs> After make, marking up, and I well, dare I say rewriting, a large portion of a draft of our paper, he came by to say that he simply had a few suggestions. Mm -hmm. Of course, he had made the paper excellent. Mm -hmm. We often think of Peter Hogg as a professor, a scholar, a mentor, the author of the Constitutional Law of Canada, the single most cited book in decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada, as we've already heard about this morning. But what we may not always be, have at the forefront of our minds and memories, and what we're here to speak about and celebrate this morning, is Peter's incredible career as a lawyer and advocate. Up on the screen, I think it's up on the screen, are a selected list of constitutional cases in which Peter acted as counsel. This is an impressive list. Many of these cases will be familiar to you, and some of them we will speak about in some detail this morning, but many of these cases you may not be familiar with. The list includes almost a dozen constitutional references, <laughs> including the reference regarding the Assisted Human Reproduction Act in, two, in 2010, and the Securities Act reference in 2011. These cases also demonstrate the breadth of Peter's advocacy. He acted on behalf of the Attorney General of Canada on Ontario, but he also acted for individuals, corporations, and organizations. He was counsel for appellants, respondents, and interveners. He could argue an issue from any angle. 
It is not overstating to say that Peter's career as a lawyer and advocate left a lasting mark on his clients, his colleagues, and the shape of constitutional law in this country. And with that, I will turn it over to Gail Sinclair and Michael Morris to discuss their experience working with Peter on the same-sex marriage reference. What a pleasure it was to recall the honor that we at the Department of Justice had working with Peter on the reference about opening up marriage to same-sex couples. I tend to insist on saying it that way because it's not same-sex marriage. It's the same institution opened up to same-sex couples. Albeit, a poignant pleasure because uh, courtesy of the, the Supreme Court of Canada registry, they provided us with tapes of the full argument at the Supreme Court of Canada for CD-ROMs. We had to figure out how you listen to a CD-ROM. Uh, and so Michael and I had the pleasure of choosing two selections to capture uh, Peter in full flight that day. But as we started to prepare, we realized how much we've forgotten. And so we prepared this brief PowerPoint presentation to make it clear to everyone here that almost 20 years later, we think that it wasn't controversial, that there wasn't a drama but there was. And so the purpose of this PowerPoint is to drive home the drama. Canada was the third country in the world to open up marriage to same-sex couples, but we were the first in the world to open it up because the courts told us to do so. So on that note, let me turn to the drama skip the slide. Uh, June 10th, 2003, the Court of Appeal renders a decision finding that the heterosexual definition of marriage is unconstitutional and contrary to the BC Court of Appeals judgment rules that there is no need to suspend the declaration of invalidity because this is judge made law. Parliament had never had need to define marriage as the union of one man and one woman. I apologize, I just realized I've skipped. So there we are. That afternoon on the, on the lawn of Osgoode Hall, marriages were conducted. One week later, the Prime Minister, Jean Chrétien, and Martin Cochon, the Minister of Justice at the time, announced that Canada would not be seeking leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, but instead would be seeking a reference. <clears throat> the reference um, is June 16th. The Governor, in General, uh, uh, Governor General asked the Supreme Court to decide three questions. The questions, I'm ahead. Oh, all right. Apparently, I'm a bit of a <laughs> happy clicker. <laughs> all right. There are the three questions. And you can see that uh, they asked questions, none of which have to do with Section 15, the equality guarantee of the Charter. All right, so the, the part that I will addre address now, uh, just having difficulty with my own PowerPoint, is that uh, the Supreme Court, in response to a motion for directions by this, uh, by this, do I, I apologize. All right, and I have to. We didn't think you'd have difficulty, technical difficulties up here. Um, 
The Supreme Court uh, responds to a motion for directions from the Attorney General of Canada, where we had proposed that the court appoint an amicus curiae, and we respond to that to defend the the uh, definition, the new definition of marriage in the proposed legislation. The Supreme Court responded to that motion for directions, and it said, "No, Attorney General of Canada, you will be the appellant." you will prepare a factum and a record and you will proceed uh, as an appellant. It was at that point that, uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> All right. Um, it's the correct one. All right. So, uh, the drama was building in that we had a very tight deadline. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Oh, uh, what happened is that and now go next. Any questions? Yes. We covered that. Now I want the next one. All right. So on um, the fact, the Attorney General's fact, um, first factum was due October 9, 2003. David Sagayas, a beloved and revered colleague at the Department of Justice, tragically died that August. And so the Attorney General of Canada was without a lead counsel for this reference. In September, Peter Hogg accepts the invitation of Morris Rosenberg, the then Deputy Minister of Justice, to assume the role of lead counsel for the Attorney General of Canada, along with Michael Morris as his counsel assisting and those of us who had been on the Halpern team supported the two of them. On September 10th, Peter Hogg met with his new team for the first time. Uh, on October 15th, the court grants the Attorney General uh, an extension of time in order to file our first factum. That factum was filed October 30th. So, <laughs> It's a very short time to assume the lead and prepare the first factum and our supporting record. December 12th of that same year, Paul Martin becomes Prime Minister of Canada and Erwin Kotler becomes the Minister of Justice. On January 28, 2004, Canada adds the infamous fourth question to the reference. And the question is set out, it had been the elephant in the room, does the charter mandate the opening up of marriage as opposed to can Canada open it up because it's the right thing to do? So on February 19, 2004, this Supreme Court sets a new deadline for our supplementary factum, 10 pages on the Section 15 issue. On March 30th, we serve that one factum arguing that traditional marriage was no longer constitutional because it had evolved with time. And on June 4th, we then serve our third factum, which was a factum to respond to all of the interveners on all of the four questions. And on October 6th and 7th, the Supreme Court hears argument. On December 9th, 2003, the Supreme Court releases its decision and declines to answer question four. So here we have a clip of Peter arguing and interacting with Justice Binney 
and just do bass stretch on question four. So if we could have that clip now. Powers, the federal distribution of powers. Question two asks about the Charter of Rights. And I will speak briefly about equality and freedom of religion. Now, with respect to equality, it's important to remember that the legislation was proposed after the decisions of the courts of British Columbia and Ontario and Quebec in the same sex marriage cases. Um, this legislation has the effect of correcting the discrimination that was found by those courts. And because the marriage, to repeat a point I made to Mr. Justice LaBelle, because the legislation applies to marriage for civil purposes only, it does not discriminate against those religions that do not recognize marriage between same-sex couples. It's all freedom of religion in section 2A. Uh, again, sorry to sound like a broken record on this, but the, the proposed legislation, again, does apply to marriage for civil purposes only. It contains in clause two the affirmation uh, that the freedom of officials of religious groups will not be forced to celebrate marriages contrary to their religious beliefs. And our submission is that no one's freedom of religion is impaired in any way by the proposed legislation. I ask you this, everything that you say on Question two, uh, it seems to me, puts into question the utility of answering question four. Because as you point out with the background of the litigation, there has been a decision as a matter of policy to proceed with this legislation. Uh, the issue uh, was not appealed from the Ontario, BC, Quebec cases because the Attorney General has accepted that the answer given by those courts was correct. Now, given that uh, that is the position of the government, and given that uh, as a matter of policy, quite apart from the legal position, you're moving forward, or the government is moving forward with this bill, seems to me that answering question four uh, uh, may not fulfill any useful purpose. One of the disadvantages, Justice Binney, of um, not appealing uh, from the uh, lower court decisions was that it has left a bit of a patchwork with uh, litigation being required in each province to clarify the situation in each province. So that it, it would be, I think, uh, beneficial for the court to answer question four and make a clear ruling that would encompass the entire country. But surely if, if this proposed bill is passed, the patchwork disappears. That is, that is, that is true. But uh, what the government has said from the beginning is that the bill would be put to a free vote. And of course, there is now a minority government in Ottawa. So I think another reason why it's important to have an answer, for, well, there are two reasons I think why it's important to have an answer for question four. One is that the answer I think will be helpful to parliament in their deliberations. And secondly, it will provide a clear rule in the event, which I don't expect to occur, but in the event the parliament did not pass the legislation. The government doesn't control the parliament at the moment. Doesn't this go back on the earlier point you made as to why the government did not appeal decisions of the courts of appeal uh, and it lost that appeal would have solved the problem you now identify. You're quite, yeah, that's quite right. It would have solved that problem. Uh, 
as I said before, the decision not to appeal was based on the Attorney General's conscientious assessment that uh, the lower court decisions were right. So that had some disadvantages. Um, and uh, I think those disadvantages will tend to be clean, cleared away if the court goes on to answer the fourth question. Shin, I should be asked your associate, but are you in any position to say whether or not the answer to question four is no, that the government intends to proceed forthwith or at any time with the legislation? The, the, the government does intend to proceed with the legislation regardless of the answer to question four. The uh, question four was not even in the reference initially. Where do I get the idea that uh, it may be a year or more is what? I think there's been some uninformed newspaper speculation, <laughs> Justice Major, which so far as I am aware is completely uninformed. I'd like to come back to this question of uh, freedom of, uh, of religion. It's argued by some of the uh, interveners that uh, there is a difference between court declaring that uh, the opposition to same-sex marriage is inconsistent with the Charter and the fact of Parliament legislating without a ruling on that issue. And the argument, as I understand it, is that if our court decides that it is uh, inconsistent with the Charter, basically it's saying that the belief uh, is not acceptable in a free and democratic society because it is it offends uh, Section 15.1, equality rights. And in that sense, you say, well, people can always believe what they like, but in a sense, uh, the argument is made, belief also uh, encompasses the right to, uh, I guess, to educate people uh, about that belief, to uh, transmit that belief through education and all of that. And uh, does that not pose a, a, a problem in your view? The, uh, Justice Bastrash, a number of the interveners have expressed concerns about those kinds of collateral issues and the difficulties that they, they will create for those uh, uh, religions that do not accept same-sex marriage. We fully appreciate and understand those concerns. Um, I, the, the reference question itself asks a very limited question about will religious officials be forced to uh, solemnize uh, marriages that they don't believe in and and that's the only question that is before you um, the, the only and so the, the these other concerns are hypothetical which is not to say that they're not real and important we, we agree they are real and important and uh, it, it, it might be helpful for the court to uh, in deal in, I don't think the court would be able to deal with the concerns because they don't arise at a factual, but to affirm the fact, uh, as we have argued in our factor, that freedom of religion is a very broad value, a value that precedes the Section 2A of the Charter of Rights. It has its roots deep in Confederation. <laughs> It's now reinforced by Section 2A. And uh, the only thing we were able to come up with in our factum was to say in a kind of soothing way, freedom of religion and the charter will deal with those problems. It's not an entirely satisfactory answer, uh, but the issue is not directly before you, uh, the court. Well, I, I think the implications of any decision are important to us. And basically, their argument is that your solution creates a hierarchy of rights, basically putting Section 15 above freedom of religion in its uh, widest uh, scope, which, which encompasses more than just a, a tacit belief. And uh, I don't think it's uh, 
personally very reasonable for you to tell us, well, ignore that, it's not before the court. I think it's one of the fundamental preoccupations of those who believe that we are indirectly suggesting here the possibility of a hierarchy of rights. The, um, in this part of the argument, it, there really isn't a clash between section 15 and section 2A, although I can see that that is one way of looking at it. Uh, all that is being proposed, of course, in this part of the argument is that Parliament would pass a law, a law that it might decide to pass regardless of what the ruling was on, on equality. And then the question would be, is the passage of that law going to infringe on the freedom of religion of those who believe strongly that the law is mistaken? And um, I, I think within the context of a reference uh, where we have no evidence, and in the context of a reference where those questions, the particular questions have not been asked, it's difficult to provide a firm position, but uh, I, I can only repeat that freedom of religion is a very broad. That was clip one. <laughs> Saved a clip two for you. Wanted to give you a bit of context first. Notice there was a moment when it appeared to be a, an angry adamant hand put a note down on Peter's desk. That was me. And um, I was suggesting he try to, to do it a little more uh, quickly because I was supposed to have 45 minutes to argue the fourth question. That was my job and in the end I got five. But I, I realized <laughs> that uh, the court wanted to hear from Peter Hogg. I'm not Peter Hogg. So I, I totally got it. I wasn't upset about it. it. It made eminent sense. And so I did the question four in five minutes. So, and they refused to answer it. So um, just a, a couple of observations before I get into my prepared remarks is it's really striking that's vintage peter it's striking how even watching it now i am sort of mesmerized how he's able to answer questions and acknowledge concerns acknowledge their legitimacy seem eminently reasonable conceding right off the bat in fact conceding something i i told him afterward i didn't think he should have conceded but in any event uh, doing it in is incredibly uh compelling way with that gravitas um, and how the court is just eat, waiting on every word coming from him and his ability to command these fantastic phrases and these exchanges that he couldn't really prepare for uh, in the way that he did. It's, it's just astonishing even to watch it 20, 20 years later. So what made Peter so special? And we divided this into three sections. Of course, these are Gail's words, not mine. Uh, these descriptions, very Gail. He had pluck, um, chutzpah in Jewish. Um, and you got to stand back. I pause to observe here. Here you had a highly controversial legal questions involving division of powers and the charter being considered in an incredibly charged, controversial political environment. It's easy to forget now, 20 years later, how divisive and controversial the issue of same-sex marriage was back in 2004. And more importantly, this reference was brought by a government that had spent the better part of five years defending and marshalling evidence and legal arguments in support of the opposite sex restriction of marriage on a very, very extensive record. Um, all that evidence now had to be explained and contextualized, and all the context in the reference for which there was no pre existing record had to be defined before the court. As Gail pointed out, the court refused us the appointment of an amicus and said, no, you do it. You figure out the record, you lead it. And Peter had to take on the, this assignment in the shadow of the untimely and tragic death of David Segaius uh, with urgent deadlines passing. Remember, it wasn't preordained that Peter was going to do this. It was supposed to be our wonderful colleague, David Segaius, who uh, died suddenly um, at the outset of that litigation. Um, and so he had to step into those shoes at the last minute. He was only retained in September 2003. Three, as Gail pointed out, had his first meeting with the team in September 10, uh, with a fact and due on, originally on October 9th. Uh, it was absolutely an incredible, monumental challenge that Peter was willing to take on here. Um, and this, all, to, all on top of the fact that the government then dis 
decided belatedly to pose a fourth question on the ultimate merits of the constitutional challenge, revisiting the issue before the courts in Halper, Nagel, and Hendricks. I won't get into the particulars of how that happened, but that was that happened after Paul Martin assumed the prime ministership after uh, Jean Chrétien, and there was um, a, a push to open up the debate, and it wasn't clear what that meant. And as it turned out, um, it became the policy of the, the decision to put the fourth question, the ultimate issue before the courts uh, in um, uh, Halpern, uh, Hendrickson, and Gal before the court in the uh, marriage reference by way of the fourth question. And as you can see, that was the matter of tremendous controversy that the court kept coming back to again and again. <laughs> the next P, prowess. First, handling difficult internal clients. Peter possessed an amazing ability to work at the margins of policy, politics, the law, and judiciary. And you saw it in that clip. Public law cases like this done on behalf of governments, often your most difficult opposition is the one you must face from within. This includes having to bring along your often difficult internal departmental representatives and specialized experts whose turf you may be treading on, and ultimately your political masters. As anyone who's ever done a high level political case for a government knows, convincing a judge of the merits of your case is but one small piece of what it takes to be a successful public law litigator. It is your internal and hand-holding work that is usually more important. And boy, did Peter do that well. And again, we're not talking about a government lawyer here. We're talking about someone from the outside brought in to work with, uh, God help him, government lawyers um, to do the job that he had to do. And he learned how to navigate within that tricky political labyrinth that is the federal government he did so with bucket loads of patience, humor, humility, and respect. He had an innate ability to read a room and bring others around to the conclusion they could embrace based on clear, straightforward, Hoggian explanations. He always understood the bigger policy, political context in which he was operating in, and he spoke to it. It was the same quality that allowed him to so skillfully size up what the judges needed of him and to assist in them coming to the right conclusions in the appeal. And again, we saw that in the clip. He never hesitated to concede where appropriate, acknowledge the challenges of the positions, articulate why the court should agree with them anyways. And apart from his brilliant internal handling skills, he was a great litigation strategist. Peter always could ignore the, ignore the noise and focus with crystal, crystal clear vision on what the core of the issue was and how to pitch it simply and understandably to the court. And again, you have to appreciate the monumental challenge he faced in that regard. What, what was the record the AGC was going to rely on having spent five years defending the opposite sex restriction and building a massive record in support of it? How are we gonna reconcile what we said then in defense of the opposite sex restri restriction with our current position without looking like complete hypocrites or fools? And I recently refreshed my memory reading from the notes of our very first meeting, uh, again, that Gail alluded to. You saw how Peter quickly dissected what needed to be done to address what we said on our old record to defend the opposite sex restriction and what we needed to consider by way of new evidence before the court, which we did. He anticipated exactly what, would be, what we needed to do, what obstacles we faced, and how the agency needed to push the position going forward. It felt in retrospect so obvious so clear, so straightforward, like that could that not have been such a great insight? Anyone could have come up with it, but it was not that. It was prescience. It was Peter's prescience and it was brilliant. And that was Peter's gift. Apart from strategy, and this is probably, this goes without saying to anybody who knew <laughs> Peter in the previous panel alluded to it, he was a brilliant legal writer and wordsmith. His nimble mind grasped and could express the most complex ideas in short point first sentences. My greatest pinch me moment, and anyone who's worked with me has heard this story from me before as a, as a young lawyer and now an uh, old one, were the moments I spent with Peter physically huddled in front of my computer in my office, jointly composing our factum, debating the merits of this or that expression or placement of a comma. This wasn't him sending me a draft or me sending him a draft and him sending me back with comment boxes. No, 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 no. This was old style. This was um, uh, 
this was literally sitting at a at a computer debating with Peter Hogg whether we should put the comma there and whether this sentence accurately captured what it is we were trying to say. Um, it was an extraordinary experience and I learned so much from him. Um, I still have his angel on my shoulder when I write factums, literally. Uh, he's there, another one is Rosalind Levine, but that's another story. She had the litigation before me making sure, do you need to use that word? I think there's an extra couple words here you can cut out. Um, Peter's there. Panache. Peter's humanity and empathy was perhaps the most memorable of his legacies. Peter had sharp legal instincts and very clear views on what had to be done, yet no one who ever worked with him felt reproached, diminished, or judged. He was always warm and collegial. Everyone working with him always felt respected by him. He went out of his way to credit others, to bring his colleagues up during a dark moment, to laugh and make others laugh. And make no mistake, this file meant a great deal to Peter. He was really proud of acting for Canada to help make it the third world, the third country in the world to extend marriage to same-sex couples. On one of my last visits to Peter at his office in Blake's, and if any of you visited him there, you'll know it wasn't an elaborate or fancy office with lots of keepsakes. Even the photos he had on display were relatively small and numbered, a few treasured shots of Fran, his kids, and beloved family. And yet, to my dismay, I found this photograph of Peter and I at the court together on his bookshelf. I don't know if that's it's on the oh, it's on a, it's on the PowerPoint, <coughs> um, the same one that was in my office. And I was floored. I mean, it's first of all very honored to have a picture of yourself in in Peter's office, uh, albeit in front of the Supreme Court of Canada. And I told him I'm surprised he put it up, and he said, "Michael, why would that surprise you? This case was one of my proudest moments." Uh, what an honor I felt to be part of it. What a legacy he left. I would sorely, sorely miss him. Uh, so we have a second clip of, of Peter, and it's during his reply. Uh, it's less an exchange with judges, and we saved it up because it showed him really summarizing what the case is about, and you'll see why it meant something to him when you hear him speak. In chief, uh, various justices asked me about this, and the, question, the answer that I gave was, I think, accurate, but rather unhelpful namely that marriage does change in particular societies at particular times and has to be appropriate to those cultures and societies. And so we see changes of this kind within Canada over time. The same argument was made by, more elegantly, I thought, by Ms. Leahy. Uh, I think that's accurate, but I think it's not very helpful. And what I say in reply is that in order to answer question one, you do not need to define all of the possible natural limits of marriage to uh, save for eternity the institution of marriage. You only have to decide one point. It's an important point, but it's only one point. Does marriage have to be between a man and a woman, as the hide and hide definition says? Does it have to be heterosexual? Because the only change that the proposed law makes is to change that particular element of marriage. Now, we've heard this morning from uh, interveners, and particularly Mr. Leroux and Mr. Brown, who say, um, and others, who say, uh, yes, marriage is inherently a heterosexual institution. Men and women are different. They're not only different sexually, but they have different roles. They come together jointly in uh, a harmonious union 
and that union is ideal for procreating and nurturing children. <coughs> What this, this court has said in a series of cases, and I'm thinking particularly of uh, uh, Egan and m &H. And admittedly, this was in a completely different context, but it, it, it is relevant to this point as well. This court has said that same-sex relationships are to be accorded the same dignity and respect as opposite sex relationships. That is what the proposed law will do. Now, what the court has said in that line of cases between Egan and uh, m and recognizes certain, one is the decriminalized, and, and, and those facts amount to a, um, a growing acceptance, both at large and at law, of same-sex relationships. And it started, of course, with the decriminalization, the, the, the legal part of it, started, of course, with the decriminalization of homosexual behavior between sec, uh, consenting adults. It moved into uh, changes to the anti-discrimination laws, changes which were helped on by this court, uh, <clears throat> but which were primarily the uh, uh, initiatives of provincial legislatures. It moved uh, on from there to the extension of spousal benefits to uh, partners in opposite sex relationships. Again, helped by this court, but primarily the initiative of uh, provincial legislatures. So I say this on behalf of the Attorney General of Canada, isn't the admission of same-sex couples to the institution of marriage, the natural next step. That is what the proposed law will do. I say that is a law in relation to marriage. I didn't know that I'd be following Peter Hogg. <laughs> I'm going to speak about Peter as a colleague and a friend, working in a law firm, Blake's, where I was a partner for many years as well. And of course, as you know, where Peter spent many years, uh, both went on leave and after retiring as a professor. It's something I think would be surprising to those who did not know Peter and would be inclined to think of him as the quintessential academic and teacher. I first met him in 1990. <clears throat> it wasn't long after I had joined Blake's and Peter had joined the firm. It was announced mysteriously to be our scholar in residence while he was on a leave of absence uh, from Osgood to work on the next edition of his text, the first edition that had to deal with the charter when it went from this thick to about this thick. Um, and uh, he didn't know really what his job was, but he was down the hall and I got to know him. I learned years later when I became a more senior person at the firm, that we paid him a modest stipend, that we gave him an office, uh, an assistant to type all of his work, and most importantly for him, a parking place downtown. Um, and he was expected to give the occasional talk. He was there for two years, and then he uh, went back to teaching, and he came in one day a week uh, until he became the dean. And then as the dean, he felt he should step aside and not have that role. And then Interestingly, when he retired as dean, he also retired from the law school, and he did retire from the law school. He gave up his office, and he moved to Blake's full time, and he spent about the next, like, well, the rest of his life coming into Blake's almost every day. In fact, the last time I saw him in the late fall of 2019, we met for lunch at Jump just downstairs from Blake's, one of his favorite uh, 
lunch spots. Uh, we did as we always did. We had a glass of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and we had a lovely lunch. Um, and I've, my point is that Peter was still coming in every day. I think he had just turned 80 at the time. Peter, is, as Bob Sharp commented to me, always described himself as a lawyer, not as a professor or an academic. He loved being a lawyer. He loved working in the milieu of a law firm. He loved, and he told me these things when I asked him, he loved being in a place that was full of people with their doors open, gossiping at the coffee machine, working away on files, picking one another's brains, talking law and how to apply it, strategizing on how to win a case, telling stories of great and terrible cross-examinations and uh, kibitzing and complaining about all those annoying judges up at uh, Osgood Hall and 361 University Avenue. Indeed, before he went to Harvard uh, for his graduate degree, Peter had worked as a lawyer briefly in his father's law firm in Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, and I think he may have disappointed his father by not following in his footsteps. He, he told me that as well, that he felt that. <clears throat> and he often mentioned that work to me. But of course, Peter didn't abandon the practice of law, although he was a scholar in residence. Sure, he worked on his academic work while he was there and his publications, but he was involved in many active cases, not just the list you see there, many of which weren't even Blake's cases. Um, he was involved in all sorts of work across the firm on a day-to-day -day basis, advising not just on constitutional or administrative law, but on tax, not surprisingly. I bumped into one of my former partners, uh, a pensions lawyer last week, and she was talking about the discussions they had with him uh, from time to time, securities, trusts, and more. We have some of the corporate lawyers and tax lawyers now, re some now retired who are in the room today. And I think that's a, another indication of the breadth of his role within the firm. He regularly gave lunchtime seminars on recent cases and not all again were constitutional cases. They were not surprisingly a huge draw within the firm. The walls literally parted in the boardrooms to open up the rooms so that we could have a hundred or more people attending his lunchtime seminars with many more watching in the other offices across the country. Peter always did these seminars with a lawyer in the firm, sometimes senior people, occasionally someone like me, but often with younger lawyers, more often I think with younger lawyers, always nurturing them, bringing them along, giving them opportunities to speak. And at these seminars, Peter would have a one pager that he would hand out. And it was one page and it was only one side of one page and it rarely filled the page and it was several bullet points, rarely more than 10 bullet points that articulated what we were there to talk about, about the case, what the points were, what the takeaways were. It was brilliant, it was clear, it was concise. And he also in that context didn't pull his punches in giving his opinions on decisions. As I recount in the piece I wrote for the Advocates Journal, for example, he was quite scornful of the wholesale travel decision of the Supreme Court in 1991 for finding that offenses for which one could go to jail, such as misleading advertising, for up to five years were merely, quote, regulatory. At the time, I was defending some large misleading advertising cases, and Peter came into my office and said, well, Paul, when your clients go to jail, he had little faith in my advocacy. He says, you can comfort them. You can say, don't worry, Bob. You're not a real criminal. You've just been found guilty of a regulatory offense. <laughs> He was a little more diplomatic in his textbook, his third edition, which I looked up the other day. I have his editions going back to Patrick's little red one. He just let the irony seek in. He wrote, the court treated it as obvious that the offense of misleading advertising fell into the regular court-tory category, despite the fact that it carried a maximum penalty of five years imprisonment. Quite a stretch for doing something that did not imply moral blameworthiness and attracted little social stigma. I also took comfort from Peter following the Canadian Foundation for Children case, the so-called spanking case. It's not what I called it, but uh, which I did with Cheryl Milne, who's here today, it was the case in which the Supreme Court upheld section 43 of the criminal code, although with a wonderful dissent from Louise Arbour, I don't think she's here to hear me say that, but there we are. Um, Peter and I discussed the reasoning of the majority decision of which he was very critical for effectively reinterpreting section 43 which was so vague, the lower court decisions were all over the map on it. 
and told us what it meant. And therefore, now that they told us what it meant, it was no longer void for vagueness. In his book, he uses the term syllogism, I don't think in a nice way in describing their reasoning. And uh, again, a day or two after the decision, he came into my office with a cartoon he cut out of the National Post, which had a picture of a, a man about to spank his young child who looked up and said, remember dad, it has to be trifling and transitory, which is, the, which is how the Chief Justice had defined section 43. I still have that cartoon taped to the wall of my office at the courthouse. <clears throat> But let me just talk for a minute about uh, one area of the law that uh, we worked fairly closely on, which was media law. We did a lot of media law work at Blake's and Peter loved that area. It was constitutional, it was freedom of expression. And we got him involved early on in the 90s in the Hill and Scientology case, which was a very well-known libel case at the time, which was going to the Supreme Court. It was the first major common law libel case to go to the court post-charter. And there was a move afoot to argue that the court should adopt the New York Times and Sullivan approach to be consistent with the charter. Some of us weren't so sure. And in any event, we didn't think it was the right case uh, to do that with because it didn't involve the media. And it had, frankly, it had malice written all over it based on the lower court decisions. So the Canadian Newspaper Association and others that we were involved with, uh, we decided to retain Peter to intervene. And he and Brian Rogers, my partner at the time, went to the court to try to minimize the harm as an intervener that the case might uh, wreak on libel law. There were other interveners. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association uh, retained uh, then Dean Sharp at the U of T, who I might say wrote a factum at the time, anticipating by about 15 years the development of the Responsible Communication Defense. It's a brilliant factum and it's prescient. Uh, Penn, the Writers Union and so on, um, retained Professor Ed Morgan. In those days, interveners routinely got 15 minutes to speak. Um, not Peter. He got half an hour. And the story goes that when he stood up and it was commented that he had half an hour, Justice Leroux de Bay was heard to mutter under her uh, sotto voce, the Peter Hogg rule. Uh, and we talked about, I, I, Bob Sharp and I still laugh about that, how Peter got that half hour. Not sure it did as much good. Hill arguably set our libel law back 10 or 15 years. And even as Peter put it in his fifth edition, published in 2007, because of Hill, quote, Canada was increasingly out of step with the rest of the common law world. Peter loved this area, as I said. He became involved in the Canadian Media Lawyers Association. He spoke at their first conference. He was a regular attendee, even if he didn't speak. Um, he loved coming to those uh, conferences and being part of our motley crew of media lawyers. Much later in 2008 and 2009, um, we, I had a case called Grant versus Torstar, which I think undid the impact of uh, Hill, to, such as it was. And I worked closely with Peter on that because he was such a, a passionate believer in what we did and he understood this stuff. And indeed, he came to Ottawa to observe the arguments in Grant, something I you know, was incredibly touched by. And we went for a great long lunch after the argument, uh, knowing it had gone well, as it was proven later. And I think there he may have broken his rule and had two glasses mm -hmm. of wine over lunch after we left the court. I'm, I don't know how many I had, I'm sure it was more than two, but it was all New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. But I do have one last story, if, if you'll just indulge me for one moment, uh, which is that I heard Michael complaining he only got five minutes. There was a case that Peter uh, was retained on. Uh, I won't tell you what it was. Well, I'll say it was an intellectual property case and there was a constitutional issue. And I think Bruce Ryder, I think I saw Bruce come in here. There he is, will recall this, that Peter was retained to argue a constitutional point and the main counsel was gonna use, I think 40 or 45 minutes. And uh, it was said that Professor Hogg would then address the court after that for 15 minutes. and it reached the point where it was time for the main counsel to sit down and he just said, oh, just I've got a few more points. And just the chief justice said, well, you know, you told us this was time. No, no, I've got a few more points. And, and about two or three times after that, the lawyer was interrupted by Chief Justice McLaughlin to say, you know, you're running out of time if you want us to hear from Peter Hogg. And unfortunately, the lawyer didn't appreciate that she meant what she said. And he sat down when the time was up and they wouldn't hear him. So they... 
the Peter hog rule didn't last forever. I remember Peter coming back the next day and I said, how did it go? And he was still kind of stunned that he hadn't been able to speak, but he understood the rules and there you were. So I hope these comments have given you some idea of what it was like to work with Peter and how much he loved being a lawyer. Thank you. I chose Osgood for law school after attending the University of Prince Edward Island because I wanted to study constitutional law and Peter was there. Peter quickly put the lie to the old saying that you should never meet your heroes. I can't imagine a more brilliant, kind, generous teacher and mentor that I, that I could have had the, the opportunity to spend so much of my career with. For my part of this panel, I thought I would direct my remarks towards some of the younger people in the room, um, people who unfortunately aren't going to have the opportunity to learn directly from Peter like I did, and to pass along some of the lessons I learned from Peter. And I went back through some of the talks that Peter gave at Blake's to associates and to students. And fortunately, he was a little more detailed than the, the advice that he gave to Justice McPherson to be organized. So I'm going to draw from those talks as well. I could easily fill the whole hour, but I'm going to focus on four lessons. The first, not surprisingly, is to be precise. When I worked with Peter on factums or on opinions at Blake's, we followed the usual law firm protocol that I, as the junior lawyer, would write the first draft. Nothing focuses your mind on being clear in your writing than trying to write in Peter Hogg's voice. No awkward sentence ever missed Peter's editing pencil. Very tiny, tiny writing along the margin. To this day, like with Michael, when I'm struggling with drafting, I ask myself how Peter would express the concept. And to me, that means using the exact right word, not necessarily the smartest sounding word. It means thinking long and hard about the order in which you introduce the concepts. In Peter's text, the placement of every chapter, every section, every paragraph, every sentence is deliberate. It is the order in which you can incrementally explain complex legal concepts to the reader. It's the most logically accretive order that the sentences could possibly be in. Essentially, Peter's baby steps to the Income Tax Act or to interjurisdictional immunity. But it also means interrogating all of the legal concepts, how they fit together, how they overlap, how they contradict each other, to get to, as Justice Monaghan said, to get to the first principle that underlies those concepts, that you have the most coherent through line through the entirety of your argument or your writing. He ensured that it was always stripped of any fuzzy thinking or any results-oriented logic. To me, that precision is at the heart of Peter's uncanny ability to make a concept, complex concept seem self-evident. The second lesson is to be curious. As a young lawyer, I, I didn't always have the confidence to admit that I didn't know something or that I didn't already completely understand the client's business, which could be a fatal flaw as an advocate. It was a great lesson to me watching Peter and client meetings and watching this brilliant man ask what I would have been worried would sound like stupid questions. It made me realize that when you ask out of curiosity and out of humility, that that creates an incredible bond with the client and ensures that you're giving them the best advice for the context they actually face in their business. In teaching associates at Blake's, Peter would say that professional work at its highest, most complex and most creative level is not work for technical lawyers. It requires wisdom that drills beneath the black letter law to see the true interests of the client in the context of the regulatory business and political environment in which the client has to operate. Acquiring that wisdom starts with curiosity. 
about the surrounding regulatory business and political environment, which was central to the normative part of Peter's work that Justice Monaghan talked about earlier today. The third lesson is to be a lifelong learner. When Peter talked about Blake's to students and associates, what he emphasized and valued most was Blake's culture of learning, the culture that made him our scholar in residence. When he gave advice to students and associates about how to succeed as a lawyer, he similarly emphasized the importance of being a student of the law and of public policy throughout your career. I can of course do no better than to quote directly from Peter in a talk that he gave at Blake's in 2005 to our mid-level associates. He said, the only, the only assets that a law firm has are its people and their talents. The best people in the firm are extraordinarily good, knowledgeable, careful, creative, tactical, wise. They didn't get that way by accident. Pure intelligence won't do it. Part of the secret is that they are terrific learners. They go to meetings of their practice group and participate actively. They take advantage of programs that are on offer at the firm. They go to conferences, they keep up with their field, but also read more widely because they know that their field is not, is just part of a seamless web. My, Peter's inspirational message, as you start to develop leadership roles in the firm, you must embrace that learning culture. It is critical if you are to become one of the best lawyers in the firm. It is also critical for the firm itself and as an example to the associates and students who look to you for work. And this will come as a terrible shock, but they may even come to see you as a role model. Few of us could ever achieve Peter's level of learning, but I can't think of a better of description of how to be a role model than the one from everyone's favorite role model. And the last lesson I wanted to focus on today is to be disciplined about having a life. Peter was disciplined about everything, but including about carving out time. I have no doubt that part of Peter's longevity at the very top of our profession was due in part to his discipline in ensuring that despite his full schedule, he always had time for lunches at Jump with colleagues, for trips to Stratford with friends, for museum tours with Fran, for ice cream breaks with his granddaughter Vera and son David in New York. He was so incredibly proud of his family. In the preface to Constitutional Law of Canada, in addition to thanking many of the people who are in the room today, he said, above all, I thank my wife, Frances Hawk, who has the happy knack of tolerating my obsessive work habits and at the same time, helping me keep a nice balance to my life. As a driven young lawyer with a natural tendency to put work first, it was a great lesson to me to have as a mentor, someone who had achieved so much while also prioritizing a balanced life. Many of my favorite memories of Peter are not actually about the work, they're about dinners that my husband and I had with Peter and Frank. In Peter's final days, I visited him in the hospital and met his daughter Anne and his sister Margaret, who had come from New Zealand to be with him. As I was leaving Margaret, who had been meeting Peter's colleagues from Osgood and from Blake's, who had come to have just a few more minutes with him, turned to me and said, he was really loved here, wasn't he? The fact that this conference is as much about Peter as a singular person, and not only as a singular scholar and advocate, is a tribute to how much he loved and was loved by this community. I suspect I'm in very good company, among other students who are incredibly grateful that they completely ignored their advice to never meet their heroes. We have three minutes. So we were gonna open it up to questions. If anybody had any questions for the panel. Oh, there's the picture. <laughs> And if no one had any questions, if there was time, we wanted to share with you something about panache, which was the third P that Michael, uh, under which Michael organized his comments. He was so much fun. First, he insisted on treating everyone 
to grand lunches. And when I say everyone, it was not just the lawyers, but the paralegals and the legal assistants. And for the first luncheon, he insisted on treating us all. And I know that at any uh, Department of Justice, and I suspect lawyer lunch, within 10 minutes, lawyers start talking about law. And the legal assistants look at each other like, why did I agree to come to another one of these events? So we wanted to prevent that. And with Peter's indulgence, everyone had to come with two of their favorite sayings about the institution of marriage. And it was so much fun because any time that someone started talking about law, wine glasses were clinked and there was a saying about marriage. And Peter thought this was so much fun. He had Madeline Rumble, uh, his assistant at Blake's, take them all and create a scroll of famous sayings about the institution of marriage. The one that didn't make it is Mae West. It's a wonderful institution, if you want to live in an institution. <laughs> <laughs> but there they are. And it has been used at a number of marriages, both same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples. And that's a reflection of how much fun he was. Thank you very much for joining our panel. And thank you to the panelists. And thank you, Jamie. Do you have any instructions for us? Okay. I wanted to give you the chance to thank your panel, but I will just uh, add my thanks to the speakers on this panel and to Laura for organizing the panel. And I don't think anyone at all will be um, offended when I say that the real star of the panel was Peter. It was lovely to see Peter and to hear him again. And uh, honestly, I don't trust myself to say more than that. Um, but moving towards lunch, uh, just a, a couple of other things. I don't know that we've done it yet. We'll do it again this afternoon, but uh, I would like to acknowledge on behalf of the law school and the organizers of the conference that Blake's has been a helper and a key part of this conference from the very beginning. And Blake's will be hosting the reception at the conclusion of the conference. So I just wanted to say that now because we have such a strong presence from Blake's on the panel this morning. The other thing I wanted to do is just acknowledge that uh, we are joined at this conference by a number of people who are online. And um, they're all across Canada. And we just want to acknowledge and thank them for being with us. Hope that you're enjoying the program. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to adjourn for lunch. Lunch is scheduled to take place from 12 noon to one o'clock. So those who are online can, can take a break. We'll have lunch served outside uh, the room here. And as everyone knows, we do have a very special panel uh, that will convene at one o'clock this afternoon, the Supreme Court of Canada judges who will give their reflections on on Peter. And so uh, let's take a nice long lunch break and talk with one another and we'll be back here one o'clock pronto. Thank you. <laughs>